Welcome to Around the Empire. I'm your host, Joanne Leon. Our guest today is Peter Lee, a.k.a. China Hand. This is a fully independent podcast. It's available on a growing number of platforms. This is a necessity now due to the widespread suppression and censorship of the truly independent media. And that requires significantly more time and resources. And independent media is more important than ever during this age of censorship. The only way it can be sustained is with your support. So lend your support, patreon.com slash around the empire, rockfin.com slash around the empire, or paypal.me slash around the empire pod. And you can check around the empire.com for all the current ways to support it. Supporters of the show receive extra bonus content with almost every episode, but most of the content is still free. As Peter Lee said, it's been a pretty good week for the China Hawks. In fact, a lot of good weeks lately. We talk about the escalation of tensions with China over Taiwan, the U.S.-led quote-unquote Asian NATO and their ships sailing through the Taiwan Strait and in the South China Sea, the Chinese military exercises, scrambling jets near Taiwan, the issue of Taiwan independence and U.S. defense, the political situation, and the prospects for war to break out, and more. In a bonus episode, I asked Peter what triggered Xi Jinping's recent crackdown in China, and what caused the sudden shift in relations between the U.S. and China, not that they were great to begin with, but they got a lot worse. We talk about the real estate crisis and why Chinese billionaires had been allowed to thrive for so long. Peter Lee has decades of experience in East Asia as both a businessman and a writer. He produces the Peter Lee's China Threat Report and has been published at Asia Times, Counterpunch, and his own blog, China Matters. Peter Lee is here, speaking to us from California. Hello, Peter. Thanks so much for coming back on the show. It's great to see you. It's great to see you again, Joanne. Hey, I listened to a couple of your latest, your latest and uh, a couple back. Uh, China threat reports. And so I wanted to talk to you. Originally, we were just going to talk about AUKUS, <laughs> but I got to talk to you about Taiwan. I mean, like you said, uh, you said something like, it's been a great week for the China Hawks. I mean, God. <laughs> and then I saw this stuff coming from the China side, which I don't know whether I just didn't used to pay that much attention to what the Chinese foreign ministry uh, says and like what the op-eds in Global Times were like. But I mean, get this one. I'm, g- I'm going to read it to you because it's not that long. It says, and first of all, you know, supposedly an op-ed like this in the Global Times may as well, you know, come right from Xi Jinping, right? It's It wouldn't get printed if, it, if he didn't. No, not necessarily. <laughs> all right. Well, here it is. It's titled... <clears throat> Time to warn Taiwan secessionists and their fomenters, war is real. Global Times editorial. The U.S. State Department issued a statement on Sunday saying the PLA was conducting intensive training exercises over Taiwan Island's self-proclaimed Southwest Air Defense Identification Zone in the past few days. Uh, This was October 4th, by the way. The statement accused the PLA of carrying out quote, provocative military activities, unquote, that, quote, undermines regional peace and stability, unquote, adding that, quote, the U.S. to commitment, the U.S. commitment to Taiwan is rock solid, unquote. The Taiwan Foreign Affairs Department immediately expressed gratitude to the Biden administration. During the National Day holiday, the number of PLA fighter jets and other military jets set a record high in their sorties over the Taiwan Straits. On Monday, before the publication of this article, Taiwan media outlets reported that the number of PLA sorties reached 18 on Monday. The intensive effort actions of the PLA Air Force are not only a severe warning to the secessionist Democratic Progressive Party DPP authorities on the island, but also clearly portrayed the severity of the situation across the Taiwan Straits, and at the same time gave a clear warning to the supporters of the DPP authorities. 
Then here's where it starts getting really good. <laughs> the peaceful atmosphere that existed in the area only a few years ago has all but disappeared, and the DPP authorities now openly refer to PLA fighters as enemy aircraft. They have constantly hyped up claims that they are at the forefront of the so-called democratic world to resist, quote, authoritarian rule, unquote. The strategic collusion between the U.S. and Japan and the DPP authorities is becoming more audacious, and the situation across the Taiwan Straits has almost lost any room for maneuvering, for maneuver teetering off the, wait, almost lost any room for maneuver teetering on the edge of a face-off, creating a sense of urgency that the that war may be triggered at any time. The secessionist forces on the islands will never be allowed to secede Taiwan from China under whatever names or by whatever means, and the island will not, al not be allowed to act as an outpost of the U.S.'s strategic containment against China. After Tsai Ing-wen came to office, the status quo of peaceful cooperation across the Taiwan Straits was disrupted. The U.S. government and the DPP authorities are trying to deeply integrate the island into the U.S.'s Indo-Pacific strategy targeting China. The Chinese main mainland will not tolerate integration of the island and the U.S. The curtain of preparations for a comprehensive military struggle by the Chinese mainland has obviously been drawn open. The PLA's military drills in the Taiwan Straits are no longer limited to declaring China's sovereignty over the island, but to implement various forms of assembly, mobilization, assault, and logistical preparations that are required to take back the island of Taiwan. Without giving up efforts for peaceful reunification, it has increasingly become the new mainstream public opinion on the Chinese mainland that the mainland should make earnest preparations based on the possibility of combat. Now we would like to, now we will like to warn the DPP authorities and their supporters, do not continue to play with fire. They should see that the Chinese mainland's preparation to use force against Taiwan secessionist forces is much stronger than ever before. Resolving the Taiwan question and realizing national reunification has never become so weightier on the shoulders of all Chinese people. Not only the US, but also some other countries are trying to use the Taiwan question as a card to play against Beijing. A fundamental solution to the Taiwan question is becoming all the more reasonable day by day. If the US and the DPP authorities do not take initiative to reverse the current situation, the Chinese mainland's military punishment for, quote, Taiwan independence, unquote, secessionist forces will eventually be triggered. Time will prove that this warning is not just a verbal threat. And when they say a fundamental solution to the Taiwan question, they're talking about, you know, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, they're talking about using force to subdue and take back Taiwan, or I don't know what language they would use, but so is this tough talk? I mean, uh, you sound pretty serious. The Chinese foreign ministry issued a statement the same day. I guess they're pissed off about uh, what Ned Price said, asked for a response. Um, based on your latest China you know, your China threat report, uh, you don't seem nearly as concerned as I am. Convince me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, I have to admit I'm a, I'm a contrarian by nature, and so I'm very comfortable right now being basically pretty much the only person who's not terribly <laughs> worried about Taiwan. Right. Um, yeah, the, uh, uh, we're we're in a, a cycle of, uh, you know, uh, provocation and counter provocation here. And, um, I would suspect that, uh, the reason global times was going, uh, batshit over that, uh, uh, <laughs> over, uh, in that, uh, op-ed was that, uh, you know, the United, uh, friends of Taiwan, either in uh, Japan or the United States or probably the Pentagon, uh, leaked the, uh, leaked the story that, uh, us Marines were training, uh, Taiwanese special forces to resist, uh, 
uh, to resist, uh, you know, invasion uh, on Taiwan, which is uh, which is a pretty much a, uh, a violates the spirit of the uh, Taiwan Relations Act. And uh, and so uh, this sort of uh, this sort of um, uh, war talk is uh, is not to be unexpected. After all, uh, a few months ago, a couple months maybe ago, um, Global Times said if there ever are uh, significant American troops on the island, that's a, that's grounds for invasion. Oh, uh, so, okay. Yeah. So you know, there's a um, the uh, it's a funny thing though. The uh, the reason that I am uh, optimistic is that. Uh, uh, nobody really wants to have war over Taiwan, not the Taiwanese, not the mainland Chinese, and uh, not the United States. And uh, a lot of the stuff that goes on here is uh, geopolitical posturing. Um, you know, the uh, uh, the United States has been uh, remorseless in uh, in uh, hyping the uh, Chinese threat in the uh, in the Asia Pacific. In order to drive the uh, the discourse away from economic integration towards the formation of a pro-China and an anti-China bloc over there, and they've been pretty much successful. And uh, uh, the uh, the big win was uh, the most I should say the most conspicuous win was the formation of the Australia UK US AUKUS uh, alliance, which uh, was explicitly military and um, involved the. Uh, uh, not only the acquisition of long-range submarines that could operate in, near Chinese waters, it also uh, uh, laid the groundwork for Australian procurement of long-range missiles that could also be used to attack uh, Chinese targets. So, um, and the other uh, the other big win, of course, has always been Japan remilitarizing uh, uh, Japan and uh, getting it to go into a offensive role in Asia has been the wet dream of the Pentagon for the last, uh, well, forever, but uh, they've been working actively on it for the last 10 years. And uh, the big news there was that the uh, uh, that uh, Japan officially unveiled an aircraft carrier. Aircraft carriers were traditionally not uh, built in, uh, in Japan because they're uh, explicitly for offensive operations outside of Japanese territorial waters. So in 2009, they started building this thing, which they called a helicopter carrier, but it was actually a stealth aircraft carrier. And uh, last year, they, uh, they added uh, a few feet to the, uh, uh, to the flight deck so that it could actually uh, take off and land F-35s. So the whole, uh, um, the whole discourse of, uh, of Asian affairs has been pretty successfully militarized there. And I think that uh, by now the Chinese have simply uh, said, well, you know, <laughs> that's the way it is in Asia. And so, uh, you know, we're just going to uh, play the game with the United States. And uh, the, uh, the subtext that I detect, which gives me cause for optimism, is that uh, um, Joe Biden, I don't think is, uh, is really interested in uh, provoking a crisis over Taiwan. You know, from the Pentagon, from Japanese hawks, and uh, from the DPP's point of view, they like a, a crisis because that will force the United States to make more explicit security guarantees to Taiwan. But uh, uh, Biden is not uh, exactly playing that game. It's, uh, the, uh, there was a uh, private meeting between Jake Sullivan and Yang Jiechir. The, uh, uh, he's the uh, guy at the state council who runs foreign affairs. And apparently, you know, the way the Chinese uh, glossed it, it was quite uh, reasonable and amicable. And that's what I see as the main drift of what Biden is trying to accomplish now. He's rolled, the Pentagon has rolled up its geopolitical gains in Australia and um, Japan and in Taiwan. And now, now, you know, he just wants to settle things down and make sure that they don't get out of hand. And I believe that the reason that the, uh, news about those Marines on Taiwan was leaked was to try to force his hand a little more. Um, as some people have pointed out, this was not a scoop. The, actually, the uh, presence of the Marines had been reported last year. It had been denied by the Pentagon. And so the only difference is, and the Chinese, of course, know, the Chinese intelligence on Taiwan is pretty good. And the only difference this year is that it was being announced as a provocation to try to get the uh, Chinese to uh, you know, do something like that Global Times editorial, which they promptly did, but um, the uh, the problem for the Hawks, as I say, is that Joe Biden is essentially dovish. You know, I was walking around a neighborhood in New Jersey, 
and I saw a sign attacking Beijing Joe Biden. <gasps> yeah. And it's really, it, in, in terms of Taiwan, it's pretty much true. Um, you know, uh, Taiwan was all in on Donald Trump. And uh, the uh, there were, and uh, also during the elections, there was an, uh, the infamous uh, laptop that was supposedly Russian disinformation. Well, there was also a dossier on Hunter Biden that was assembled in Asia, which was uh, intended to show that uh, Beijing Joe Biden was in the pocket of the CCP, and that was uh, prepared out of Taiwan. And uh, I think Joe remembers that, and he's not particularly happy. And, uh, you know, he doesn't want to get rolled by the hawks. He doesn't want to get forced onto the escalatory ladder because uh, um, I think his instincts are that, you know, the Pentagon is basically run by warmongering idiots. Look what they did in uh, Iraq and in Afghanistan, you know, and he was willing to pull the plug on Afghanistan. And I don't think he wants to push the plug in on a war over Taiwan. So we see the game I see here is a lot of uh, provocation mainly coming out of the Pentagon and also coming out of the, the uh, Japan hawks because they see an opportunity to try to get the United States to make an explicit security guarantee to Taiwan. But uh, it's being resisted by the civilian leadership in the White House and also, I'd, uh, I suspect, Lloyd Austin, the uh, Secretary of Defense. Austin was brought in, again, because the China hawks' preferred candidate, Michelle Flournoy, was not liked by Joe Biden. <laughs> So I wrote about this uh, earlier. Um, you know, basically, uh, the uh, uh, Joe Biden's favorite Secretary of Defense during the Obama years was Chuck Hagel. They were personal friends, and he spent a lot of political capital lobbying to get in. But he got totally screwed by the China Hawks, and he was forced to resign. Michelle Flournoy was on the short list to take over for him, but she said she didn't want to take over during a lame duck Obama administration because it would hold her back. And, you know, Joe Biden remembers that sort of thing, I'm sure. And so when it uh, when uh, everybody was saying, ah, it's going to be Michelle Flournoy, who uh, was very, she was the one who made the famous threat to sink every Chinese ship in the South China Sea within 72 hours to deter a blockade or invasion of Taiwan. He was very happy to pull the plug on her and put in a rather sedate, you know, uh, uh, Secretary of Defense, somebody who's interested not in playing policy and winding up conflicts, but a guy who's there to you know fight wars and then wind them down as the civilian leadership sees fit. So long story short, you know it's uh, you know there's a lot of crap going around on Taiwan, but uh, I don't take it very seriously. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, <laughs> I, w I really would like. I mean, I would love love to just you know completely agree with all that but it's gotten kind of difficult to sort out the differences in foreign policy and a lot of policies frankly between the trump and the biden he's just carrying on so many of the trump policies and you know you explained some of that with just trying to appease different factions and things like this i mean it was a great sigh of relief when michelle flournoy did not become <laughs> <laughs> the Secretary of Defense, because, you know, it looked pretty much, but she was Hillary's, she was going to yeah. be Hillary's Secretary of Defense. I mean, I don't think anybody oh, disagrees Victoria with that. Victoria Newland. Victoria Newland was going to be Hillary's Secretary of, oh, yeah, Secretary of State. Take it back. Edit that yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. it was going to be I Newland. Mean, picture and that, Florida. right? <laughs> Michelle Flournoy, Secretary yeah. of Defense, and Newland. I mean, Victoria who knows we'd even be standing here State. right now. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, um, yeah. But here's the thing, you know, as you mentioned, and I've I've always thought the Biden administration, quote unquote, Biden administration is a compromise between the Clinton faction and the Obama faction and whoever else uh, on the quote unquote Democratic side of the, mm -hmm. the spectrum. And you mentioned that, I mean, I knew there were some familiar names, but I didn't realize that uh, Hillary's Chinese China foreign policy team is now Biden's for, uh, China foreign foreign policy team, and I definitely did not know something you had mentioned. And I guess I'm changing topics a little bit here, but some of them you said that they spent a lot of time in Australia <laughs> during the <laughs> Trump administration, They're like preparing for this AUKUS thing, and I don't know what else. 
But um, so anyway, if if Biden is so different from the Hillary Flournoy faction or even from the Trump faction, then why did he bring in Hillary's China foreign policy team to his cabinet? Yeah, well, he recognized that, uh, um, you know, China hawking was the way to go because, uh, you know, he organ basically our entire national policy, not just foreign policy, is now organized around the theory of competition with the People's Republic of China. You know, it's uh, that's what uh, that's what's driving our domestic industrial policy. You know, the whole idea of supply chain security and all that. So, uh, you know, uh, the uh, the emergence of a bipartisan Democratic, Hillary Democratic, maybe, but largely Democratic and Republican consensus that dicking with China was the way to go. You know, he's not going to go up against that. What he's what he's really doing is he's using his position as president, which I guess still has some power to sort of moderate that and uh, channel that into areas that he prefers. You also mentioned that was it the Secretary of the Navy or I forget who yeah, it was now who actually Secretary said, of Navy, yeah. you know what that don't kind of came right out and said that we you know we don't want war with china uh i don't know if you remember off the top of your head what he actually said frankly he he kind of laid out the policy <laughs> he said frankly we don't want to fight a war over taiwan and that's true of everybody <clears throat> just to give an idea of the logistics involved here you know there's a uh, you know, you can listen to the scaremongering if you need it. You go to Project 2049, which is run by Randy Shriver. But, um, you know, the uh, uh, for uh, for counterinsurgency, as we all know, the ratio is uh, one soldier for every 25 people. And there are 25 million people in Taiwan. And so if you don't want to go in there and do a totally half-assed uh, occupation like we did everywhere else, I think it was 100 to 1 in Iraq or something like that. Yeah. You know, you got to go in Rumsfeld's brainchild. Yeah. So you got to go in big. And the Chinese, and how are you going to get a million people across the Taiwan Straits? I don't even know if they have a million soldiers available. So <clears throat> the idea that uh, the People's Re and uh, also the People's Republic of China does not have a lot of uh, sea lift capability. Maybe they could fly them all in on Air China charter flights. I don't know. But anyway, the idea is that they're going to storm the beaches and they're going to take over Taiwan, I think, is is a fantasy. A fantasy that I should say is shared by uh, some uh, Chinese on Twitter, you know, who say, yeah, man, they, we're going to go in there and the Taiwanese will just surrender and it'll be great. You know, but that's not, that's not how I see an invasion going. Now, the more likely scenario is that, uh, you know, China lobs a few dozen missiles into Taiwan you know, the uh, the uh, the economy goes bye bye. The stock market crashes. People start fleeing and it turns into a, uh, you know, a, a rather messed up state. And that's what really is feared by everybody on Taiwan. I mean, there's uh, there's currently about 2000 missiles targeting Taiwan. I don't think the uh, missile defenses will catch them all. But uh, just regular missiles or nuclear? No, missiles? no, no nuclear stuff. Okay. You know, China is China is still committed to a. Uh, a uh, strategic nuclear deterrent, no first use. So they have a bunch of big nukes out there to hit the United States, but uh, they don't have any tactical nuclear weapons that we know of anyway. So, you know, it's uh, it's all good, clean fun, you know. But uh, the uh, as I said, the point is that uh, the, uh, um, the Chinese uh, threat to Taiwan is simply to crater it uh, economically and socially. It's not to actually invade and take it over. So, you know, the... Um, all you know, uh, you uh, read these stories about how they're going to take all the Chinese ferry boats and use them to move a million troops across the uh, Taiwan Straits, and you know, <clears throat> the United States uh, is committed to blocking an invasion of Taiwan. So you're going to put all these people on ferry boats and uh, assume they're going to make it across the Taiwan Strait without getting sunk. It's pretty ridiculous. Can we um, talk real quick about the current government in Taiwan? And sort of the political, I'm not too sure of what the political situation is there, how stable it is, uh, you know, yeah. how how likely an, an, another pro-China government could come in or that kind of thing. And also, yeah. I, I before I forget, just to bookmark this for later, if we could also talk about what kind of agreement we do have with Taiwan. I'm a mm. little confused on that. 
<laughs> okay. Yeah. So the uh, Taiwan is uh, it's uh, the dominant political party over there is called the Democratic Progressive Party or DPP, and uh, the uh, party that's uh, on the outs now, perhaps uh, forever, is the uh, KMT. The uh, traditionally the uh, KMT was the party of the uh, invaders from the mainland who fled <coughs> with Chiang Kai-shek in 1949. Oh, right, right, right. And dominated the island under martial law. Uh, the majority of the uh, island's population is uh, um, indigenous Chinese who have been there for a few hundred years, um, mainly from uh, Fukien in, uh, in southern China. So um, once uh, martial law was phased out by uh, Chiang Kai-shek's son, uh, then the uh, it didn't take too long for the uh, uh, Taiwanese uh, indigenous political forces represented in large part by the DPP to take over. Um, the uh, you know the DPP is uh, really relies, I think, to a certain extent on the uh, China threat uh, to uh, to keep things going. So they're always hyping it because the Taiwan's dominant economic partner is still the mainland. Economic logic dictates, uh, you know, a certain amount of economic integration with the mainland, but they're trying to uh, fight that. And uh, so they uh, spend a lot of uh, time uh, hyping the Chinese threat and uh, talking about how they need to be protected. The foreign minister was out there uh, uh, last week appealing for aid from Australia, from Japan, and the United States so they could do this bastion of democracy thing out there, you know, 120 miles from uh, the mainland. And uh, that solidifies the uh, DPP's rule. I think under non-militarized uh, freakout uh, uh, <coughs> non-militarized uh, freakout conditions, uh, the DPP would have to either moderate or maybe even, uh, you know, face the threat from a more moderate third party. Before the uh, Hong Kong demonstrations of uh, two years ago, mm. um, they were actually uh, on track to lose the presidential elections, but uh, they were able to mobilize public opinion behind the China threat when the Chinese, uh, you know, put down the demonstrations in Hong Kong. So me, that's I, and the uh, I also think uh, the Chinese uh, communists in uh, Beijing, they feel that, uh, you know, there's a moderate countercurrent that given the proper amount of time and circumstances could turn Taiwan away from this sort of uh, extreme anti-mainland anti political stance. That situation in Hong Kong, uh, I wonder how it makes people in Taiwan feel, you know, do they just trying to hope that Hong Kong will be become an example that Taiwan will then, I mean, they probably do hope that this will happen, mm. that they'll see the progression of, of Hong Kong and say, oh, you know, maybe we should do the same thing. Or was, was that almost like a buffer zone? Like, oh, well, they're going to, you know, they're going to first mess with Hong Kong and, and they'll leave us alone for a while. But now that Hong Kong is pretty well subdued, assuming that is the way things go. Mm. Um, I don't know. Do, do they feel a little bit more threatened that their way of life might change, that they may become more um, absorbed into the, into the system? Like, what do you, I guess I'm really asking for opinion here. Yeah. What do you, has it made them more scared or a little bit more serious or what do you think people in Taiwan are thinking? Well, I think that the you know the uh, Deng Xiaoping when he uh, you know had his uh, uh, reign in China, his big policy strategy was uh, one country two systems. So he was going to offer autonomy to Hong Kong, autonomy to Taiwan, and as you know, they would. Uh, uh, renounce their uh, independent foreign and defense policies, and uh, you know those things would be handled by the motherland, and everything else would sort of creak along. Uh -huh. <laughs> that I think was a stupid idea, um, and I'd say that uh, the lesson of the Hong Kong demonstrations is that de facto the one country, two systems philosophy is dead. The uh, uh, the the CCP feels that these uh, peripheral areas, Hong Kong and Taiwan, are too vulnerable to uh, U.S. subversion and local discontent and uh, giving them autonomy in their local affairs is simply not an option. So the big thing over there is the, in Hong Kong, it's a national security law, and they've uh, used that to crack down on 
local domestic uh, political activity. Um, and, uh, and I think that that uh, really uh, recognizes a Chinese surrender of its dreams that they would actually be able to reintegrate uh, Taiwan into a, a Chinese uh, People's Republic of China political system. Because, you know, basically everybody on Taiwan said, you know, <laughs> we can't trust the, you know, we can't trust the Chinese to come in there and, uh, you know, do our, uh, you know, and, uh, and let our domestic uh, systems and our domestic security and media and all that stuff operate independently. And I think that the CCP, uh, they, they made the decision, you know, they knew that this was going to screw up uh, relations with Taiwan, but on the other hand, they had this this ongoing, long boiling riot going on in Hong Kong. So they said, "We got to fix Hong Kong, <clears throat> and we'll just uh, have to de facto abandon the idea that uh, we're going to have a viable political program to integrate Taiwan." And I think now everybody, you know, you, the only words that you'll ever hear that uh, in uh, Taiwan relations is status quo. Status quo is what 70% more or less of the uh, Taiwanese electorate wants. It's the policy of the U.S. government, the Taiwan government, and even the Chinese government is that uh, basically it stays like this. You know, there's a uh, de facto, there's, uh, you know, Taiwan is sovereign, and uh, but de jure, it's not independent. And that sovereign, got strength. but not independent. Okay. <laughs> That's what that means. You know, they didn't declare independence and uh, and oh, okay. assert, assert the right to set up a, a mutual security treaty with the United States and Japan, which is the wet dream of the uh, China hawks. Mm. Yeah, so yes. now this is a good time then to talk about the agreement that we do have because it's a little confusing. It's supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> So what yeah. kind of an agreement do we have with them? We have we basically have an agreement that, uh, well, there's two things. The first thing to remember is that uh, the United States pointedly never acknowledged that Taiwan was part of the mainland. There was a there was some heavy fudge work done in there, and again, this was not some of Deng Xiaoping's best work. But you know, he's thinking, hey, you know, I got to get this agreement with the United States. So <clears throat> basically, the United States position is there is only one China, but it right. does not. But it does not say that Taiwan is part of that one China. So that gives us the leeway to uh, treat them as an independent political authority. Uh, the other thing is that, uh, you know, uh, uh, in the Shanghai communique, we said that we would uh, demilitarize uh, Taiwan. People as old as I remember there was a military assistance command there and all sorts of troops and airfields and uh, port calls by uh, U.S. Uh, Navy vessels and that sort of stuff. So they're going to get rid of that. But, um, you know, what the, this is a common pattern, the, what the United States gives with one hand, it takes away with the other. So then Reagan, uh, 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 Ronald Reagan, when he came in after Carter, he, um, he went through the Congress and passed the Taiwan Relations Act, which committed the United States to supplying Taiwan with sufficient arms for its self-defense. So there is the uh, uh, the United States has committed itself to um, quote maintaining the status quo over Taiwan, and that means that uh, they can never uh, uh, officially uh, support uh, Taiwan independence. Now, <clears throat> uh, the interesting wrinkle in Taiwan affairs, I think that uh, few people in the West appreciate, is that uh, Taiwan takes its cues on how to deal with the United States from Japan. Um, Japan, uh, Taiwan, as we all know, was a colony of, uh, Japan from 1895 to 1945. And, uh, the elites were all educated, uh, in the Japanese system. And, uh, many of them served in the Japanese armed forces or military police. In fact, the father of, uh, of, uh, uh Taiwanese democracy, Li Denghui, his, his brother, uh, was a, uh, a, <laughs> A Japanese military capo and is actually enshrined at Yasukuni, the uh, the shrine for uh, Japanese soldiers over there in Japan. So the uh, <clears throat> the uh, Japan and uh, Taiwan actually share a particular outlook on the United States, which is also shared by the Pentagon, is that uh, the American civilian leadership cannot be trusted in dealing with Taiwan. Uh, the uh, the seminal moment was the Nixon shock where he uh, went to China, 
cut off basically through Taiwan in the ditch, didn't even tell the Japanese. And so the Japanese and the uh, uh, Taiwanese have always clubbed together. The DPP, the ruling party there, has very close relations with the Japanese far right. And, uh, you know, the uh, basically the China hawks over there. And so when they uh, and so when you see a policy coming out of uh, out of uh, Taiwan, it's usually, in my opinion, been cleared with the Japanese and also with the pro Japanese guys over at the Pentagon. Pentagon is basically Team Japan. I mean, we've got all those uh, military bases at Okinawa and Yogasaka over there. So <clears throat> basically, the three of those are trying to drive American civilian leadership away from engagement with the mainland and something more in the lines of a formal security guarantee for Taiwan. Mm. And uh, that's come out uh, quite clearly in the last uh, two months because the Japanese uh, government has started to call Taiwan vital to Japan's survival, uh. which is bullshit, which is bullshit. But uh, that's the pretext because, you see, they have a peace constitution over there and they cannot engage in military activity outside of their territorial uh, waters and airspace unless there is a pretext that uh, Japan's national survival is at stake. And so they've been, push they've been pushing that line and the Japanese, uh, you know, the, ta the Taiwanese have been quite happy to go along with that. And the whole idea behind it is to uh, get the uh, United States to make a formal commitment, if not for the Taiwanese, for our Japanese buddies to defend Taiwan. Yeah. And would that require renouncing the one China uh, policy? No. No, we're already no, committed. Because they can use that I other. Mean, Japan's our treaty loophole. ally. If we're basically, if they, if we're able to, if they're able to repackage an attack on Taiwan as an attack on Japan, mutual defense treaty comes into into uh, force. We're defending Japan. They're our treaty allies. So none, none of the other stuff even matters. One China. None of the other stuff even matters. Yeah, exactly. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yes. But uh, you know, uh, like I said, a lot of this, the, the, a lot of this stuff I see is uh, is kabuki. The um, but uh, the thing is that because the... you're saying Japan needs a reason to remilitarize, mm -hmm. and so that is what's driving, and it's easy to know what's driving things on this side, or at least to some extent. <laughs> the Navy always right they uh, they feel uh, an existential threat, or uh, they feel that they they're being called obsolete, and you know yeah. they still like these giant ships that are just like sitting ducks. Yeah, and. Uh, Always the competition between the branches. Uh, yeah, yeah. But, but you know, now the uh, the only people who are left out are the army. You know, <laughs> it's really interesting because you when you read about these things, you know, they, they, they were actually people who said, "Well, the Middle East was an army show, and now it's time for the uh, Navy and the Air Force to get a taste out in the out in the Asia Pacific." And even the Marines have uh, gotten involved in terms of, uh, you know, uh, doing these scoot and shoot uh, missile attack uh, systems that they're, they're installing out there. So, yeah, you know, there's, uh, there's, plenty of, uh, there's plenty of opportunity for bang bang out there, but the bottom line has always been that the first victim of a war with China is gonna be Taiwan. You know, <laughs> it's, uh, so, you know, that's sort of, uh, they're playing, a, they're the ones who are playing a dangerous game over there in Taiwan, so. Uh, the, uh, but like I said, I just, uh, you know, I don't see it happening. You know, it's uh, funny. You ask me about semiconductors, right? Semiconductors, the world's largest producer of high end semiconductors is Taiwan Semiconductor uh, Corporation. And uh, Taiwan Semiconductor used to be called Taiwan's Silicon Shield. The idea was that they would never, that nobody would ever allow the Chinese to attack Taiwan because it would endanger the world supply of semiconductors. Well, TSMC's biggest uh, customer was the mainland was mainland China, and uh, they're uh, they're actually rather unhappy that uh, now they're being forced not only to uh, cut off uh, uh, chip sales to Huawei, who was a major customer of theirs, but now in the name of China confrontation and the famous supply chain security they're being forced to move capacity to the united states yeah building a plant in arizona uh they've also agreed texas to build... i think 
where I think there might be one coming in the Austin <laughs> area. I could be wrong. Okay, I think Intel was going to pull it in, but anyway, maybe you're right. And uh, the uh, and the Japanese have twisted their arm to build something in there so they can get their semiconductor industry back. And the Europeans also want to get into the semiconductor game. So, uh, you know, this is, uh, I think that, uh, you know, the thing that gives to Xi Jinping optimism in Beijing is that uh, this uh, the Taiwanese policy basically has a, has a ceiling on it. There's only a certain amount of geopolitical advantage you can get from enrolling in an anti-China alliance with the United States and Japan. The economic costs are big, the war risks are big. And so, you know, from the, uh, from the mainland's point of view is that, uh, you know, I think they would just like to let the whole thing fester, you know, for, you know, a few more years, even as they build a much bigger uh, military capacity to, uh, to do things in the South, in the, in the China Straits. And, uh, you know, pretty soon somebody in, uh, you know, somebody in Taiwan will say, hey, what we did before was stupid. Now we should go back and be smart. Yeah. They're not in a good position in, in all the ways that you just pointed out. Uh, at the same time, though, they want to maintain a status quo. So, mm -hmm. they're, you know, their way of life is sort of a threat. So there is that. Um, <laughs> I don't see it. I don't see it, you know. They basically ring fence their econ uh, the uh, advanced areas of their economy from the Chinese. <coughs> the um, Taiwanese uh, media laws and uh, are still pretty much uh, state of war media laws, and so you know, actually, you know, it's interesting. All this fake news stuff and disinfo stuff. A lot of that uh, campaign was uh, was road tested in uh, in Taiwan in order, of, you know, to uh, to purge mainland influence from politics and from the media and from business. So, you know, pra practically speaking, what's going to happen? You know, they're not going to invade. Hopefully they won't lob a few missiles over there. And if so, the status quo will just keep creaking along. And their defense is, is not very good, right? You mentioned that China was able to fly around through their back door because their defense is only... Yeah, I know. That was a... That was I a very that. comical. I, was, I mean, gallows humor kind of. It's none of it's really funny, but some well, some of it is comical. Funny. Okay, the first. Uh, by the way, um, I just want to uh, point out that uh, you know, in addition to Japan, the Pentagon, and the DPP being totally on board with uh, uh, with heightening tensions over Taiwan, there is of course the international media, and I will look, I will say you know basically Reuters, AFP, New York Times. The Telegraph, Daily Mail, all those people. So, and of course Australia. But there was a spasm of misreporting about these uh, Chinese flights as um, you know penetrating uh, Taiwanese airspace. Mm. We know that's not correct because they were actually flying in international airspace the entire time. So uh, they, there's nothing that the Taiwanese could do to complain. The Taiwanese have an air defense identification zone where somebody flies in that particular part of uh, international airspace, uh, they're supposed to go up there and take a look to make sure the planes don't turn left and, you know, fly in there and bomb, uh, and bomb Taipei. But uh, uh, these, uh, those, the Chinese uh, aircraft uh, flights through the uh, ADIZ were uh, very carefully plotted and also, uh, as I point out in the piece that I wrote recently, they were a proportional mm. response to the uh, U.S. massive uh, naval exercise that took place in the Philippine Sea just off of Okinawa. Um, at the same time that the Chinese did the fly-throughs, uh, the United States had, had organized a six-nation, 17-ship, three-aircraft carrier and helicopter carrier um, jamboree involving uh, the United States and uh, Japan and the United Kingdom and a few other smaller countries. And uh, uh, the thing that I like to point out is that uh, the Ronald Reagan, that was one of the carriers, has a capacity, uh, carries uh, 90 planes on its air wing. The Carl Vinson uh, carries about 57. Add that up, you get 157. And how many planes did the uh, Chinese uh, fly into the uh, air defense identification zone? 153. And so, you know, again, I, I considered this as not an escalation, but a proportional response. Of course, the media, the Pentagon, Japan, and the DPP 
wanted this to be regarded in the popular sphere as an escalation, which means that because that means that we get to escalate more from our side and, you know, put in more troops and uh, run more operations over there. But as I said, the proof of the pudding is in the eating and Joe Biden did not take the bait. Instead, Jake Sullivan and Yang Jiechir had a routine meeting discussing points of Chinese uh, and uh, an American uh, difference and hopefully agreement. And the whole thing just went rumbling along. And then <clears throat> when they didn't escalate, then the news about the Marines was re-leaked in order to, you know, turn the crank a little bit more and say, hey, Beijing Joe Biden, you know, <laughs> and get it, you know, yeah. look, at what, uh, look at what Global Times just wrote. You know, so it's a, uh, but uh, yeah, Taiwan's uh, military is, is, is not up to snuff. Uh, you know, they're not going to be, you know, the, uh, um, yeah, it's just not there. I mean, it's a country. It's a. It's about uh, the size of Shanghai. You know, and China's right across the Taiwan Straits, and uh, they have a, you know, a bunch of uh, military wings, airfields. The other thing about Taiwan is that uh, it's only got a limited number of airfields, and those are the first to go in a shooting war. And that means the planes have no place to land, which means they have to ditch or fly to Okinawa, which is kind of far away, and. Uh, and uh, at the same time, China's got a couple thousand missiles targeting various, uh, you know, military targets over there. So it is not particularly uh, practical for the though the Taiwanese are always bragging that they're going to, insisting that they're going to fight to the last person. It's it's just not practical. But uh, the uh, everybody's afraid of Taiwan being a free rider, starting a war by declaring independence and then saying, come on, Uncle Sam, help me out. So uh, uh, that's a, that's another thing where the, particularly the civilian leadership that doesn't want to have a war is extremely wary about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I could definitely, uh, you made your case, you made your case <laughs> pretty well. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, now we're, the, the other thing to remember is that uh, virtually every scenario for a Taiwan-related war in which the United States participates ends in a nuclear exchange. Because the only way that you can uh, stop uh, the Chinese attacks on Taiwan is to make strikes deep into the Chinese homeland. And the, uh, the, uh, the standard uh, expression is never cross swords with a nuclear power. So uh, the idea is that, you know, if we're going to duke it out with China, we want to do it in the Taiwan Strait, you know, fight, fight, fight in international waters there or, you know, <laughs> over Taiwanese territory. But the point is, if you're actually going to try and win the war and particularly make sure that a U.S. carrier doesn't get sunk, you're going to have to launch massive uh, attacks on the Chinese mainland. And that has prepared every scenario from what Lawrence Wilkinson said every scenario ends in a nuclear war yeah it's yeah. been a while since those war games and the chinese navy is a little different now than it was then but yeah i don't think the fundamentals have probably changed mm -hmm. the uh and you know like i whenever we have conversations about this sort of among ourselves i'm always like you know a war with china it's just it can't happen uh it's really really dumb from just a supply standpoint you know you don't go to war with someone who you depend on for i went digging for what that number is, is you know what percent of our imports are are from china and it was a smaller number well first yeah. of all it varied <laughs> it varied a lot it was a smaller number than i expected but i mean any store that you go to try to just try to get daily consumer goods without Oh. things made in china I mean, no, and all the components and yeah. all kinds of things i mean you would just totally yeah well throw the funny things thing into is, a total is, tailspin well the funny thing is remember decoupling decoupling yeah. was that's that was actually the china hawks magic bullet one of the most interesting things was that always confounded the china hawks was uh i'm sure we all remember george kennan in yeah. his uh, long telegram the whole idea of containment was based upon the China idea that the Soviet Union was an autarky, that it had shut itself off. And Deng Xiaoping made the conscious decision, 
he was not going to get and find himself in the Russians' shoes. He was going to integrate China into the world economy. And, so, and when globalization went bananas under Clinton and, uh, you know, during the, the whole George Bush, uh, George Bush thing, China went global in a huge way. And so when Trump uh, came in and basically after a little bit of hesitation turned the store over to the China hawks, they immediately started decoupling. You know, the idea was that uh, we're not going to have a vision of shared global growth. We're going to have a vision of the U.S.-led free bloc or democratic bloc or whatever you want to call it on one side, lording it over the Chinese bloc on the other side. So hasn't really worked that great, but, uh, you know, it, uh, they did manage to do some pretty uh, serious decoupling in the areas of electronics. You know, and uh, the idea was that everything was supposed to move to India. You know, the tariffs would go on China and everybody would move to India. Well, they moved, the Chinese moved to Vietnam, you know, <laughs> and uh, Indonesia and all those places. So it's still Chinese factories, uh, you know, making Chinese stuff. But it's uh, the physical location of the plants are now more and more moving to Southeast Asia. But that was a trend anyway, because Chinese labor costs are going up. Right. So it's all part of the world. But anyway, yeah, so uh, I... You know, if you talk to the Pentagon, they're saying, hey, we'd get our hair must. Remember that line from Dr. Strangelove, you know, Break economically, a few eggs. <laughs> you know, you know, and stuff like that. You know, maybe there would be a shortage of toys at Christmas, but we could fight a China war, you know. Come on. <laughs> I, I personally do want to be, I think we're a little too coupled. I think just from, I don't, I don't care who it is, China or whatever, but I yeah. just think you need to be a lot more uh, self-sufficient than, than we are right now. But it's happening. You know? Yeah, well, I hope so. Yeah, it's um, not called. Uh, it's not called. Uh, you know, national planned economy anymore. It's called supply chain security. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, so the idea, I guess, is that uh, you know we'll we'll still be importing uh, you know billions of dollars worth of stuff, but it'll be coming from U.S. allies as opposed <laughs> to China. You know. Right. Right. Yeah. All right. Well, we're almost up on an hour, so I should probably flip over to the. Uh, to a bonus question, if that's okay with you. Okay. <laughs> um, well, I could talk to you all day. I could definitely <laughs> I could go for another hour or two, at least. Um, so I have I have two questions, and I can't decide between the two. I guess we probably already covered this. You know what? There's been a shift, and okay, there's a new president. Yeah, so maybe it's that, but like. Then you have Soros, you know, like lashing out against Xi Jinping and there, there something seemed to happen that caused some kind of a shift. Mm -hmm. And then around the same time, you know, I read about this blog post and and then Xi Jinping did did his big crackdown. And what what happened there? What was what happened at that point in time that caused this? this shift. I don't even know what else to, to call it. Well, Something happened. changed. Something yeah. changed significantly. What was it? The answer to the bonus question is in the extra bonus segment for patrons. You can get access to all bonus content by subscribing at Rockfin or Patreon, plus other perks like patron live streams, Zoom calls, and access to our Discord channel where we can talk among ourselves. So that's my pitch, and I hope that some of you will join us. And now I'll continue with the interview wrap up. Well, I probably shouldn't keep you any longer, but okay. promise to come back again soon because <laughs> I have about a hundred more questions for you. <laughs> okay. It'll be great. Yeah. If you would, um, again, thank you so much, and and please come back on the show again soon. Uh, an informal poll uh, among some listeners on the show, you know, most interested in which topics they're most interested in. And, China's at the top of the list. Right. So uh, <laughs> I did want to ask you, and maybe this is something you could email to me too. Besides your, uh, I don't have that many sources for mm -hmm. Asia in general, certainly on China, uh, besides your reports and following your Twitter feed. So maybe, um, maybe you could give me a few recommendations of some good people to some blogs, some uh, Twitter accounts, and some journalists who are are good because there's just so many crazy China hawks out there. <laughs> and then at the other side, but there's also these, you know, 
people with the rose colored glass about China too. And I, I, I don't really have much time for them either. I, I want somebody like taking a real, uh, realist. I, I want like more of a China realist. Yeah. Well, that's good. So. You know, actually, um, uh, you know, and the, uh, there are some uh, actually. Uh, there's a couple uh, Chinese commentators. You know, uh, you know, and, uh, yeah, Chinese that would be citizens, great. and you know, they're uh, you know they know what they're talking about, and uh, and I will uh, I will uh, send you the uh, I'll put together a list of those, and I'll send it, and you can post it over there. And um, that would be perfect. And tell everybody how to find you, mm -hmm. um, how to subscribe to your China Threat Report, and mm -hmm. all that good stuff. Okay, well, my uh, my Twitter handle is uh, China Hand, and I spent a lot of time on there, too much time probably. And um, my uh, Patreon is uh, Peter Lee's China Threat Report. Uh, you can Google it, and it'll come up as a hit. And uh, you have to pay money in order to read most of the stuff. But I do have a lot of unlocked content because you know, right. you know. Like that girl in high school says, if I give it away long enough, people will start to pay for it. <laughs> so, so anyway, so uh, yeah. And your blog, your the even the older content from the blog is still, I mean, yeah, China matters. It's still is, relevant, you yeah. know. Yeah, I, I I go into that thing all the time. So, yeah. um, but I haven't started updating it since I haven't been updating it since I started the Patreon. But uh, P, uh, that, that thing is called chinamatters.blogspot.com. Uh, and it's got a lot of stuff. I mean, I started blogging on China back in 2003, I think it was. And it all goes, and it's all on there all the way through to, I think, uh, 2018 or something like that. And so basically, you can watch the evolution of China yeah. hawking on that, uh, on that blog. Yeah, it's good stuff. Uh, really good stuff. And I appreciate it. All right. Well, until next time, um, take care and hope everything's well. And I look forward to talking to you again. Thanks, Joe. It was great to be here. Loved the conversation. I hope we can do it again soon. Thanks for listening. Special thanks to Peter Lee. Follow him on Twitter at China Hand and subscribe to his China Threat Report on Patreon. This podcast is independent media. Listener support, really important. Patreon.com slash around the empire, rockfin.com slash around the empire, paypal not me slash around the empire pod. Find it on any mobile podcast app. And you can go to the website around the empire.com to find all the information that you'll need. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Follow on Twitter at around the empire. Join us on Telegram, t.me slash around the empire. And we'll see you next time. Take good care, everybody. Stay strong.